If you want to know how fast the Titan submarine came down crashing on its occupants, tune in. Hey everyone, welcome back. Today I'm estimating how fast the Titan submarine crashed on its occupants. If you remember, um, the Titan submarine was trying to explore uh, the Titanic wreckage at a depth of 1900 meters, very deep ocean. And uh, tragically, um, the submarine uh, imploded. That's our best guess of what happened. And in, I wanted to get an estimate of the time it took for that implosion to occur and how fast the hull came in crashing on its occupants. And I wanted to set it up from a fluid mechanics hydrostatic perspective without overcomplicating things with stresses, etc. So I will be making a few assumptions to allow for this analysis to occur. First is that once the hull was breached, the implosion was catastrophic. In other words, it's in symmetric. In other words, it happened um, almost instantaneously. All the entire hull came in crashing symmetrically into the center. Specifically, what I will assume is that uh, all the pieces, every point of the hull, are accelerated at the same rate to the center line. So we're going to take a differential element on the cylinder and calculate the acceleration at which the pressure forces caused it to accelerate and from that deduce the time to implosion and the speed at which it came imploding. I have some properties over here. The submarine was at a depth of 1900 meters, gonna call that H. It had a length of 2.4 meters, and interestingly, that length is not gonna show up in the analysis as we will show. It had, the hull had a thickness of 12.7 centimeters, and the density of the uh, carbon composite material that the hull was made of, as my best guess from what I found on the internet was 1750 kilograms per cubic meter. Now you can repeat the analysis with other numbers um, if you have better information. Uh, G is the uh, gravitational acceleration. We're going to take that 9.81 meters per second squared. And finally, the water density on average is going to be 1020 kilograms per cubic meters. Okay, let's get that set up. All right, we're gonna assume a cylinder for the submarine, for the occupants, okay? And it has a little thickness over here, okay? This is the internal radius, and we're gonna um, assume that on the entire surface, there's this equal um, pressure acting on the surface everywhere, radially inward, okay? And we're going to take a differential element. We're going to take a differential element. So let's blow that up a little bit. Okay. And it has a thickness delta, let's say. Okay. Thickness delta. This would be lengthwise delta L. And this would be angle-wise delta theta. And this is the inner radius, or inner and this is the outer radius r out. So we know also that r out is r in plus delta. Okay, great. Now, at every point on the hull, there's a hydrostatic pressure that is being exerted by the column of water above it. Okay, and that pressure results in a normal force on the hull. Okay, so we're going to call this P. And that normal force is delta F. I'm going to call that delta F is equal to minus P N D S. Okay. And D S is the surface of the outer hull. And N is the unit, outward unit normal of that surface. In this case, it's, it's E R. Okay. And so that's going to be minus P E R. And D S is the surface area. That's R out delta theta times delta L. Now, According to Newton's second law, delta F is equal to mass times acceleration. So that's the acceleration of the fluid element itself. Okay, so we already have delta F. We can calculate delta M and from which we can deduce the acceleration. So what about delta M? This is the mass of this fluid element. Now remember, of this, of this uh, material element on the hull. Well, now, remember, this was 
R I and this was R out and this is delta, delta theta and delta L. Okay. So for delta M is going to be the density of the material of this carbon composites times the volume delta V and the volume is delta V is some average radius or the inner radius or the outer radius really doesn't matter I always like to take the average radius times the height okay so average radius times delta theta so that gives us this length over here uh, along the circumference times the height the thickness of this element delta times delta L okay so we get for delta M equal rho C times R average delta theta times delta times delta L now R average is simply R inner plus R outer over 2. Okay, so that gives us density times Ri plus R out over 2 times delta theta times delta times delta L. Now recall that R outer is Ri plus delta. So what we get is rho C times Ri plus Ri plus delta over 2 times delta delta L delta theta. Okay. This can be further simplified into rho C Ri plus delta over 2 times delta times delta L times delta theta. Okay, great. Now we can equate the two to try to estimate and estimate the acceleration. So remember we had delta F equal MA, delta F equal MA, and delta F was minus P R out delta theta times delta L ER so force in the inward radial direction okay so that's what we obtained um, from the previous uh, from the previous slide and that's equal to the delta M the mass of this element which was rho C times RI plus delta over 2 times delta times delta L times delta theta and remember I told you that the length doesn't matter and indeed the length cancels out over here and delta theta nicely cancels out. Now R out is also Ri plus delta so we get minus P Ri plus delta Er is equal to rho C to Ri plus delta over 2 times delta and times the acceleration so we forgot that times the acceleration so from that we can deduce the acceleration and we say that the acceleration is equal to minus p r i plus delta over rho c r i plus delta over 2 times delta in the inward direction so indeed as expected this acceleration of the element um, is pushing in now you can simplify this say ri plus delta over 2 delta is so small compared to ri and these practically cancel out so you could potentially approximate this by saying the acceleration is minus p over rho c delta if you want to get some estimates but we can actually punch in some real numbers over here and get actual values for this now we're still left with the pressure so this is um, our equation for the acceleration of that fluid element we still need to compute the pressure the pressure is e easily computed um, pressure at 1900 meters is equal to the density of water times gravitational acceleration times h and at that depth we had 1020 kilograms per cubic meter right times 9.81 that's meters per second squared times um, h 1900 meters okay so that is going to give us force per unit area and it comes out to about 19 million pascals okay that's about 187 atmospheres um, that's pretty high um, a pretty high pressure um, in any event you can plug this number back into our formula and from that we can compute in the actual acceleration so you plug in these numbers and that acceleration comes out to be a is equal 
meters per second squared. That's a really high acceleration, okay? Very high acceleration. Now, from the acceleration, we can deduce the time it took for the implosion to occur. Um, we'll use a couple of formulas. Okay. First, we're going to say that du by dt is equal to the acceleration. Now, this is all inwards, okay? so no need to track vectors, etc. just um, scalar numbers here. And dx by dt is equal to u. So that is going to give us that u is equal to acceleration times time. And we're starting from zero speed, so before the hull collapsed. So there's no initial speed um, for the hull to collapse. Now, from this second formula, this is going to tell us the distance traveled at a given speed. And now u is a t. So that tells us that x is equal to 1 over 2 a t squared. And we're also starting from the circumference. Okay, if you assume that going inwards, this is x, okay, um, that's the x equals 0 over here. So all of these elements are accelerating at that same uniform acceleration inwards. Now, remember, that was a critical assumption in my analysis in that, um, now remember, this is a critical assumption in this analysis in that all of these elements are going inwards at the same rate, the same speed, etc. And so we can track one element or 100 elements, doesn't matter. They're all going to come in at that same rate. Okay. So all we need to do now is figure out how long it takes for us to reach from going from 0 to R in. Okay. So how long for us to reach R in? So if we put R in is equal 1 over 2 A T squared implosion time. So the time it took to do the implosion, then we can invert this and say T implosion is equal to the square root of 2 R in over the acceleration. Okay, And that gives us about 0 0.0039 seconds or about 4 milliseconds. Okay, 4 milliseconds. Now, the I, for it to register information, the brain takes about 13 milliseconds, so the occupants didn't have a clue what was going on. Uh, according to this analysis, the collapse happened so fast, they had no idea what was going on. Now, with this T implosion, you can also deduce the speed at the center line of these elements once they all crashed into each other. And you could do um, U center line. Line is equal to A times T implosion. That gives you about 362.54 meters per second at the center line. Now, remember, as the hull is accelerating at this constant, speed is changing linearly, so it gets faster and faster from T equals 0, but then at the center line, it is the fastest. All right, so I hope this analysis was um, helpful in thinking about practical um, problems. This is a tragedy, of course. You can make assumptions to, uh, I hope this uh, example was helpful in how you could use your knowledge to try to look at actual real problems happening um, in our surroundings.